tell us a little bit about uh, what you work on, uh, what what you're passionate about, and then uh, yeah, we'll we'll just jump right in. Do you guys want to take it away? Sure. Yeah, I'll hop in first. Um, Tom McLaughlin, Chief Investment Officer of Coral. Um, we're a asset manager in the crypto space. Um, by background, I started my career in investment banking after studying finance. Um, basically worked on the high yield bond desk, issuing debt for casino companies. Um, hopped full time into crypto uh, after like a half a decade in banking. Um, just really haven't looked back. Um, started a mining company in between and have been kind of trading my own book. Um, we started Coral with kind of the idea that there was a lot of um, asymmetric ways to capitalize with deploying capital directly on chain because um, it's kind of out of the reach of true institutional capital at this point. So um, we kind of are a full stack investor. We run uh, everything from a market neutral strategy, which Josh is um, successfully deploying to um venture capital and early stage investing. So um, kind of our thesis is that blockchain will um, enable like true financial global markets for the first time. So um, everything we do is kind of with that in mind. So I'll pass it to Josh. Yeah. Um, yep. Josh Kruger here. I'm a partner in uh, PM at Coral. I run the liquid side, so the, the high yield delta neutral stuff. Um, and then a lot of uh, some of the directional uh, liquid stuff. And then um, in the main fund, the the Delta Neutral there as well. Um, I got a background in computer science. Um, started with algo trading in college. Uh, got into crypto there with some mining stuff, like a lot of us, I'm sure. Um, I kind of went down that rabbit hole of just trying desperately to, to, to do algo trading and algorithmic market making. Um, ended up starting a couple hedge funds doing that along the way. Uh, worked in um, distributed compute um, at a big tech company for a while. Um, and then DeFi Summer came back, and I, I kind of jumped back in crypto full force. And I've just been doing uh, basically full-time research and trading um, for the last uh, four or five years here. Um, and now I'm at uh, me and Tom work together at Coral. Like you said, we're trying to build a uh, the premier asset management business for Web3 and trying to get all the verticals. Awesome. Oh, I guess I'll jump in next. Um, Jake Tantliff. Uh, my background was primarily in the brokerage space as an algo trader. Um, as well as the financial technology and kind of SaaS platforms as well. Um, I'm the director of sales now at Dexable, uh, and our mission statement is essentially to enable people like uh, Josh and Tom here on the tech side and, and bringing over the execution layer um, into the DeFi space that uh, is kind of taken for granted in the uh, traditional finance space. As an ex-broker, I think the the areas of crypto that I like the most is bringing the efficiency side of what crypto is and removing the entire need almost of the sell side, front, middle, and back office, automating all of that and removing all those middlemen, which I used to be. And part of my job as one of those brokers was to make myself redundant slowly over time. And I think that's come to full, full fruition now uh, in this space. Uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go next. Yeah, so it's Mitchell. Uh, I'm under the, the Dexable icon right now, but I am one of the co-founders from the Dexable team. I've, I'm kind of a crypto native, just crypto startup guru. <laughs> i just been through it all. Um, I started before even the first NFT craze with an early uh, coin analytics platform and then went into NFTs, but then the first winner hit. I wanted to become a better developer and I linked up with some guys I knew in the DC area who are my co-founders, Mike Kuhn and Mike Powers. And the three of us, the three musketeers, M, M, and M, as we're called, embarked on an adventure. Uh, we started off in general blockchain automation. So like tying web three to web two, whether that was discord bots, emails based on on-chain no notifications, all, all that sort of stuff. In DeFi summer, we transitioned into DeFi. Uh, it took us several months because we weren't financially savvy ourselves. It was a very foreign territory for us. But you know, we, we learned a ton. We had we were working with funds like Coral, and those those fund managers, portfolio managers, were instrumental in us figuring out okay, what what is the first version of this thing going to look like? 
fast forward a year and a half and we now have an extraordinarily advanced <laughs> execution platform. Uh, we figured it out. <laughs> it wasn't easy <laughs> and it's still not easy, but uh, yeah, we have something really cool to show for, for that adventure. So, yeah, it's, I, I'm impressed. I've been impressed um, seeing kind of Dexable grow and um, kind of all the areas you guys are touching. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Cool. So I titled this conversation about post-merch post -merge trends and adoption because, one, it's, it's just like an interesting topic. It, it's a mixture of speculation, financial trends. It's, it taps into like what the core technology does, maybe how it's different. It's, it's very closely tied to like investing theses. You know, if you're bullish in this market, what, what is the current trend or what are the narratives behind this trend that we've most recently been seeing in prices and all that sort of stuff. But is it, is it here to last? Uh, is there a, enough support beyond this initial like rush up to like, you know, September to keep things going? Or is this kind of like a, a short hype cycle when people realize my, my ETH doesn't unlock for another six to 12 months? That there's this, this merge hype concept that we've been talking about. I mean, pretty much as long as I can remember, probably four years or more at this point, at least. Yeah. I think, I, um, I think it's seven years in the making, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much always been there. Um, <laughs> and uh, because, I mean, it's the ultimate meme at this point. Like, <laughs> it's, been, it's basically been around since I've been started in the, uh, in the industry. So, yeah, six, seven years. I was taking a look at some Reddit threads from even two months ago, like this two months ago. So this is in the summer and people are still debating. Yeah. They said it's going to happen in Q3. Not no chance. They've been talking about it for so long. There's no, no way. <laughs> so the fact that it's finally here, it's just kind of like uh, the dragons in game of Thrones. We're, we're finally getting what we deserve, you know, <laughs> But only partially. You know, I find that really interesting about about this merge. It's a it's a massive step towards you know the end goal of, of Ethereum. But two steps after that that really unlock what is possible here. You know, this sets the foundation for you know, as you said, Mitch. You know, unlocking um, any of that locked up Ethereum um, and also bringing gas prices down. But you know, what's interesting to me is is six months and twelve months from now when hopefully not seven years per, I guess, KPI on the roadmap to actually deliver what Ethereum sh should be. Yeah, I think um, to your question about where, you know, what, what is the momentum like? I think um, it's, it's really hard to say, and it's actually probably very path dependent based on uh, kind of macro and the broader crypto uh, flow of funds. Uh, I think if you look at it closely, the market is probably telling you uh, well, futures contracts kind of go into, into backwardation now and then kind of indicate they probably will be in contango afterward. And that kind of tells me that pro maybe that some part of the market thinks um, that it is like a BTC happening event where it is the spark that kind of brings it back to life. Um, and I know since all of us are so deep in the space, it's hard to tell that things have been quite bearish for <laughs> over like a year now. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be unexpected for us to get some short term or long term momentum right after the merge, given kind of the fundamental factors we're all aware of, the commission rates changing and uh, kind of the, just the fundamental analysis on staking that makes it quite attractive to institutional players, especially when they can do it leveraged. Um, and then there's also the, the other side of that, which is um, kind of the bearish macro take and that it's kind of running up into basically like an earnings recession slash corporate recession, an economic kind of slowdown, and that it really is just a bear market pull and um, – you know, it's it, the market needed a narrative to redeploy all the cash we, we had sitting on the sidelines on the way down. Um, and it, it got that and it probably will continue to do that up into the merge. Um, and then I'll, there's also a lot of free money on, on the line. Um, as you guys probably know, with the futures contracts, um, you can, you know, pretty much make the FPOW, FPOS spread right now. Um, and everybody loves free money. And in general, crypto's um, hype cycles are around how much free money, quote, free money is available. Um, last time it was kind of it started with BTC happening, went to yield farming, and you know we all saw sushi swap and all that. This time it's um, some really intricate plays around um, kind of uh, kind of you making money on the proof of work f 
chain and then also capping the spread and then also the fundamental analysis of F potentially becoming a better investment going forward. It's a lot to be excited about. Not to say it's anything more than a narrative, but um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of I, split. I kind of I kind of echo that. I'm like I'm juggling this short term bearishness of the macro headwinds, which are very obvious to everybody. Um, and in the kind of environment we're in, we're going to just run into those. Um, but I do think longer term, and this is I mean this is I've changed my opinion on this. Um, kind of completely 180, but um, Ethereum just becomes much more attractive as an investment post-merge um, for all, all the reasons Josh mentioned, but um, specifically kind of around the supply and demand and um, you know the user-generated activity um, that comes in the form of fees and supply. Um, Wall Street and institutional money love yield, so um, you know Bitcoin doesn't produce yield. Bitcoin's really good at you know kind of doing its thing, but um, Ethereum could actually, from an economic standpoint, become deflationary. And if that does happen, it is actually a better, um, I guess, mousetrap than Bitcoin at being Bitcoin. So uh, that thesis, I think, is not talked about enough. And I think, you know, we're also deep in the weeds that I think we kind of lose sight. There are a lot of people that are not aware or um, still don't think the merger will happen who are actually intelligent investors. So um, I don't, you know, it's um, kind of mind blowing to be in that camp, but um, all that is to say, I don't necessarily believe it's priced in um, over the long run. What's your horizon on a long run? If it's not priced in now, I mean, this is a fairly new announcement, right? So you, you would imagine it, it would be priced in. What's yeah, your position I, on, on it, one, happening, and two, you know, if, if it's been fully priced in or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go real quick and then get past the Josh. Um, I, it's definitely going to happen. Um, I mean, you know, we've had kind of the most altruistic and smartest people in this space working on this now for seven years. So when they say it's going to happen, it's going to. Um, I've talked to a couple of people who have, you know, dedicated a couple of years to this, um, have roots from Consensus um, and Ethereum Foundation, and it's going to happen. Um, whether it's priced in again, I think like a good barometer of this is like the Bitcoin dominance ratio. And, um, I think ETH is going to continue to kind of ladder up against Bitcoin. So, um, I don't necessarily think it's fairly priced in, uh, just given the outrageous upside that Ethereum can have as an investment over like the next decade or two. So, uh, I don't think it's fully priced in, but again, um, it's going to be hard to actually get real feedback on that when we're facing kind of macro headwinds. We'll we'll know for sure um, when there's actually like a breakout and um, all the economic factors and kind of um, everything is kind of moving in the right direction. So um, it's going to be hard to get feedback on that. And my kind of timeline for when I say short term is generally like 12 to 18 months. So mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the macro is a big question, right? Uh, What's going to happen with European debt, you know, the U.S. printing money and obviously where we are with inflation, whether it's sticky or not. I think that's going to be, the, to me, that's one of the main things that is causing a lack of of price of people pricing in what's um, what's happening with the merge. I was reading this earlier today. And one of the interesting points, and we, I think we all know this already, but you know, as far as narratives are concerned, even if the like the short term um, pricing <laughs> is something that people are concerned about, there's also the the longer term impacts that this will have, both in terms of broader. You know, there's a lot of crypto hate out there. It's a symptom of just bloat, lard, and scammers that aren't even trying to hide it. And one of the easy ways to cut down crypto beyond the scammers is the this environmental argument and it's been there mid last year mid to early last year is when i first started seeing people really complain about crypto's environmental impact because it'd become mainstream at that point to the point where it's like okay nfts are here it's this blockchain thing it's it's using coal and oil 
all this greenhouse gas is getting emitted and it's we're burning the world and like it's like what what is it really doing for us well this merge thing is really significant reducing the the energy and power consumption by upwards of 99 percent <laughs> or more <laughs> is a really significant argument it, it pretty much cuts the war in tide in half because half of their their base is like oh we don't know who we're dealing with in DeFi. um so yeah, we can't deal with anonymity and all that nonsense. And then there there was this power consumption. It's terrible for the environment. Do you guys think that that impacts how broader retail even view crypto, whether they even want to participate in it, whether they think it's good or bad? Uh, I, well, I think um, objectively you could say it is good for, for real, for certain. I mean, it's not that it's not a uh, goose chase to say that using less energy is better, and if you can attain the same security by doing so, um, then obviously that's superior. I think with the world the way it is now, the kind of recent events, um, and kind of people are conscious that energy is finite, and that they're, and then you know, you couple that with a lot of the green movements, which are trying to like psychologically um, quantify what the negative externalities are of using all these natural resources and the kind of the longer term effects. It is kind of a perfect storm in terms of a narrative where we achieve a similar or greater security, but also um, are just you know better for the environment slash more sustainable long term. Um, and now I know the arguments about Bitcoin, about it mostly being green energy and stuff, and um, that is great. But that is you know, does the world really need two energy consuming nation state resistant um, ledgers, or can one of them be a little bit more advanced and on a proof of stake um, kind of more economically driven chain and achieve the same output. And I think most people in the market's probably telling you, given the FBTC ratio, that it certainly represents um, like a longer term, more sustainable, longer term, more sustainable future for Ethereum than Bitcoin. I mean, as we've seen off the bottom on this whole thing, um, you know, people are really excited about this. And I think retail, you just say it's greener and that's, you know, that, that might be all you need to say, <laughs> really. I'm wondering, purely from an investment perspective, environmental aspect of it, to me, doesn't really translate into sell pressure. Well, or there is a quite a big people difference. people coming in to the space. Well, there, there's a quite a big difference between proof of stake and, and proof of work in that in proof of stake, you attain your um, inflation rewards through like no actual expenditure of energy in any real level. Whereas in, in a Bitcoin mining operation or a, mine, a, a true proof of work oper operation, you literally did convert some kind of energy into hashing power, and thereby you do need to sell your rewards in order to pay that expense. That is Where true. in proof of stake, you don't technically need to do that. Now, I think be, both me and Tom, Tom's opinion here is that you know if a highly financialized economy will always find a way to add leverage, and if you can achieve delta neutral yields, you will. And so it, most of the F inflation will be sold. Um, just kind of like Bitcoin, but there's just going to be less of it. Whereas, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, those miners, they need to sell their Bitcoin in order to stay uh, like buoyant as a business. And that doesn't necessarily need to be the case in proof of stake, which I think that's the, the big difference there. Right. The way that I'm thinking about it, it, this merge does translate to a removal of a significant amount of sell pressure, particularly with, um, with miners and how much is being burned and all of that. But in addition to that, to me, I don't feel that the retail any retail sell pressure or people coming into the crypto space is for environmental reasons i feel a lot of the friction coming into the space is that crypto is kind of a scary scary place to operate and the the ui user experience is pretty difficult to to manage from a retail perspective and that seems to be to me a, a bigger headwind bringing outside money into the space than the environmental perspective yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. That being said, I think that the environmental factors of this are kind of maybe the third or fourth most important part of the whole kind of thing, because ultimately, even in the proof of stake system, you're still using energy in some form. So um, the whole conceptual idea of turning energy into money. Um, but you do have the, you know, in my opinion, the large part is obviously the change in the supply demand economics and um you know, going from the 13,000 ETH a day that are handed out to miners or paid to them um, to secure the network. And that should, you know, I've seen kind of estimates anywhere from like 1,300 to 4,000 over the next year in terms of like per day 
um, supply. So that, you know, that becomes a big deal right away. So um, you kind of tie that with um, STE not unlocking for um, six to 12 months. And you do have this kind of opportunity to kind of spark another potential bull market. It's just a matter of where that value will accrue across the board. So I think ultimately this is going to be a very good move for Ethereum and a step in the right direction. And look, it's like uh, the environmental concerns, I think, are kind of secondary to all this, but it can't hurt. So um, I know that there are lot, there are, there's lots of money and um, people that are opened up that are not otherwise available when you kind of take the wasteful energy part out of it. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, and I'm particularly interested to see how it plays out in the regulatory space as well, because if it's more environmentally friendly, it's possibly easier for uh, the political aspect around crypto to lighten. Yeah, to build on um, Tom's point there, you know, what retail really loves is momentum in any kind of uh, speculative market or just market in general and, you know, less emissions and therefore less required inflows to pump the price makes it easier to create price momentum. And I think ultimately in crypto that at the end of the day, it's all about momentum and people just want to buy something going up in general. If this aids in that, then I would say, yes, uh, the, this is going to bring in retail eventually. Especially if it's impacting gas prices. What have you guys been seeing as far as um, how strategies involving uh, staking ETH or, um, you know, like the futures concept how has that been sold to institutions have they been more favorable to that approach um, with engaging versus other sort of DeFi mechanisms right now anytime there's uh, like a delta neutral yield available like there is with the futures right now or any kind of thing that uh, approximates the proof of worth a proof of work f value um, you know, large hedge funds kind of like us or, or someone else will definitely participate in those just because you can procure. It is essentially at the end of the day, it's kind of free money um, if, if you intend to sell the proof of work F. Um, and so, yeah, there's been broad participation in that. And I would almost argue that one of the reasons BTC has performed so poorly in, in the last two or three months is because the, the most consensus trade is short BTC long F, i.e. long the FBTC um, ratio. There's a lot of money to be made there, and everybody's kind of aware of it. I think the last thing in the stack is probably actually going on the proof of work F chain um, and, and running a bunch of strategies to accumulate as much of it as, and then bringing that back out and selling it because it is kind of also uh, costless and neutral. So that's also shaping up to be a very popular way to, to play this as well. And I think you know, we know people uh, investing a lot of resources in doing that. Can you explain that last point just a, a little more? Uh, about uh, procuring proof of work F on the that chain? Yeah. Well, for example, let's say you had um, token A, and token A's got a pool uh, on an F right now where it's like, you know, it's it's a typical Uniswap V2, so half half. And, you know, post merge, you have that same value on, on the proof of stake chain, but you now also have that pool in the proof of work chain. Well, your token's actually worthless because the project's on proof of stake. So what you'd want to do is be the first person to sell it to procure as much of the proof of work F as possible, i.e. drain that pool. Um, and because that's the only thing that's going to have value. And so there's this game where everybody's finding a way to, to procure as much of the proof of work F on the proof of work chain after the merge as they can, because that'll be the only way to get money off the chain and make and basically make money. Does that make sense? Oh, gotcha. I guess I assume that many assets would be just automatically forked onto the onto the beacon chain, so <laughs> that there wouldn't really be this demand for that proof of work token in order to facilitate that transaction or even well, that so bridge. The proof of stake chain is going to continue next block, and you know, an average user, I mean, the chain ID doesn't change, so they're never going to know. But that yeah. proof of work chain will live on, and every token on that chain is worth zero except the proof of work F. And so all the schemes by which you go and you drain the Ave money market, you drain the two pools, you know, you pr you do a bunch of trading strategies ahead of time to get as much F as you can, maybe borrow as much from Ave on, on and then post merge you have a bunch, uh, because the only the only token of value is that proof of work F on the proof of work chain. So, I mean, if you think about it, 
let's say there's $500 million in the, the FUSDC pool, right? Well, USDC has publicly stated they're not going to support the chain. So that's now worth zero. So, but the proof of work F isn't. And so how do you siphon as much of that proof of work F out of that pool as possible and then go sell it on some exchange? So that'd be like, that'd be a trade um, that somebody's going to be executing on. Gotcha. Because you, those, those two pools yeah. will still operate. Yeah, right. that, that becomes just a game of speed. Cool. You know, we've talked a little bit about how this could start and restart a, a bit of price momentum. So, you know, there is a an Ethereum roadmap after the merge is slated. Probably one of the bigger things is shorting, but that probably won't happen for at least another half a year to even longer than that. What do you think the immediate fallout of this is going to be? Is it going to be more demand for L2s? Um, is it going to be, oh, finally, the, there's a really cheap main chain. This could make arbitrage between mainnet beacon chain and some of these L2s more feasible. Um, does it make the desire for certain applications that currently are too expensive for some of the, the more retail users on the mainnet today more feasible? Does it change the, the landscape of usability from an application perspective where you know a lot of people are starting up on a less expensive network like Optimism, Arbitrum, or Polygon because you don't have to pay ridiculous fees every time you want to do something? What is that going to look like? Oh, I, th I think it just looks like a continuation of what we have now. I mean, ultimately, proof of stake doesn't it introduce any more scalability than we have now. So... Um, it, it really is just an emissions slash investability change in Ethereum itself. And, uh, and obviously, the higher Ethereum goes, the more expensive it is to transact on main chain, just given the way gas fees are, are quoted in essentially F. Um, so, yeah, there'll be continued um, people using rollups and et cetera. I mean, I don't think it changes anything fundamentally for the L2 or the alt chain game. I mean, at this point, um, at this point in the market cycle, uh, EVM block space is basically a commodity. Um, so there's there's so many chains providing it that there really is no shortage. So it really becomes a who has the most composable um, set of financial tools, where is the most liquidity, and where are the network effects. And I think those will continue to gravitate towards um, a winning L2. Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of pause momentum on Optimism recently. I think their their token played pretty well, really designed well. Not shilling optimism or anything. <laughs> I'm just saying it's something I've seen. No, yeah. I mean, we've seen over the last 12 to 16 months, like it's basically just a hot ball of money that's rolled around from, um, you know, ETH mainnet kind of being the base um, or like the mothership. And then it kind of has run from BSC to uh, Polygon and Matic, you know, Phantom. So, you know, now it's arbitrum and optimism. Um, so kind of pick your flavor, um, but ultimately at this point, it's kind of too early to tell which one will be the best. Um, but I don't think anything, yeah, like to Josh's point, nothing fundamentally will change from a usability perspective, but um, it's just whoever can attract the best developers to build the best set of tools and get money to be kind of sticky. Because I think one of the problems that we see is, one way you kind of go with this yield farming model of attracting capital um, for the short term, it doesn't doesn't stay when that, those emissions are up. So um, we need to find more sustainable ways to you know incentivize usage and reward users while not um, kind of relying on that as a mechanism to attract capital. What would be some of the advice that you would give to some of those projects right now, as far as speaking to the market that we have today, attra attracting users, like speaking to like where the demand is, given the, the maturity of things, focusing, putting a lot of focusing more on economic incentives, you know, lockups, long-term stability of like a protocol. Is it being really innovative? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all of those above, but ultimately I think uh, over the long run, you know, we can continue to play these games of fast money and hopping in and out. But ultimately, like the goal is to build products that people will use and people will use around the world and um, create kind of economies of scale that were otherwise not possible. And so that's really where 
kind of this whole thing becomes interesting is when um, we're able to build like build liquidity pools for like USDC and the euro that are larger than um, are available on like, you know, the world's biggest Forex exchanges. So um, those are the kind of things I'm looking to. Um, I think for entrepreneurs, it's like just build stuff, people that will build stuff people need and will use. Um, and I think of like a lot of these projects really just would benefit from not having a token and just focus on like fixing it, like finding some need in the market and fixing it. So um, that's kind of my take at the moment, but that, you know, that all goes out the window when you have a bull market. So we'll see. Yeah. I, my, my kind of take on it is, um, you know, the, the kind of yield farming approach where you're just throwing tokens at everybody is a little bit played out. Um, and there's a lot of money out there still looking for interesting, uh, quote, games to play. And so if there was ever a time to just kind of innovate on tokenomics and really use them to drive network network effects and usage of your platform and do something novel, it'd be now. Um, because the market is looking for that next sticky template. Um, and it'll be replicated a bunch of times when someone finds it. But the risk reward to be crafty and have really you know novel tokenomics that drive those network effects um, is the best it has been you know, since 2020 right now. That's a very interesting take. <laughs> huh. I wonder what we'll see. Uh, the next form of Olympus, maybe. <laughs> I'm uh, Jay, the potential you... in the pseudo swap stuff, too. So with, with that advice, how... I'm curious, how does that relate to what you guys are doing on the Simul side? Are you guys planning on putting out putting out a token attached to the to your efforts on with Simul? Um, no, right now there's no plans for a for a token on that. I don't think that really fits our business model with Simul. Simul is really designed to give um, like institutions slash like really sophisticated traders and hedge funds the best tools to both track and risk manage their DeFi portfolios and trading. Um, and so the, our mission is entirely focused around that. And um, we're kind of doing a SaaS model on that, given the, just the raw expense required mm -hmm. to aggregate all that data. Um, and I, there's, if there was room for a token, I'd be open to feedback on it. But I don't believe there – I don't think that's our primary goal right now. So um, given that we're targeting kind of a B2B setup and then eventually rolling out to like a broader market um, kind of uh, retail person. Yeah, do you mind giving a, a short, like, short explainer on what Simul is, how it relates to Coral, the the ideation, how the two work together, um, mid and long term? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, if you guys have been in the industry for a while, which I'm sure you guys have, you would kind of know that if you're trading in DeFi, um, or just kind of doing things in DeFi, one, it's a pain in the ass to track where all your positions are at and your exposures. And what protocols you're in, and especially you know if you scale that up into a fund context, maybe you're running um, 20 wallets, you've got 100 positions, they're scattered about all different theses, they're inter interrelated, they're in different protocols, which all have different risk factors, etc. Um, that's a lot to manage, right? And it's 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 actually kind of impossible to do mentally. Um, and so Simul is designed. So well, the first thing is there are providers out there like like D Bank and stuff that'll give you like a snapshot of what's happening right now to the best of their ability, right? They actually read the chain and give you that. But nobody's actually doing historical. Um, and to that point also, nobody's actually giving you complete coverage. So the idea with Simul, um, and this is to aggregate all the APIs out there, you know, the D-Bank, Zephyr, Xeron, Aboard, TronScan, all the, you know, everything, and throw it through an engine that um, merges it all down in, into consolidated balance sheets on a, on a very high um, like resolution. We're, right now we're doing hourly. Um, which is about maxing out um, all the APIs. And by doing so, then you have a data set where you can, well, out of the box, we give you um, like an Amazon QuickSight kind of uh, full access where you can like mix and match your data and, and do any kind of data science you want from that regard. But, you know, on top of that, it once you have that historical data set, you can do a lot of risk management type things that TradFi does in the normal traditional world, in traditional finance world, that people in, in um, crypto are still doing just based on gut, essentially. Um, so we're thinking like uh, technology-adjusted rate of return, i.e. like what is your uh, discounted smart contract risk? 
across all your protocols? Um, and when is it heightened when correlated with prices and the general market momentum? Um, we got a, we got a guy who uh, might do some um, simulated drawdowns and put your portfolio through um, simulated events to see what to see what you know where your risk is hiding in your portfolio. Um, and so basically, it's to do advanced things like that where you do need that super dense, high quality data set historically of everything you've done, your P and L, everything. Um, and currently, that doesn't exist in DeFi. So um, that's what we're aiming to build. We need it for ourselves. Um, you know, we pay a lot of money for a fund admin, but that only goes so far. And the average guy certainly doesn't have a fund admin. Um, so that's kind of the target of the whole thing. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, frankly, there's there's a lot of performance analytics that are lacking from the portfolio managers that exist, um, even for most retail users or kind of deeper traders. Um, like you might have some custom scripts so you can see what your performance looks like, like from a nominal perspective, you can even maybe run personal back tests, but having a really easy way to get started up and, and using something that's already integrated with all those APIs would be pretty useful. Yeah. I mean, that historical data set allows you to do a lot you could never do before. And I, I think it's, it's addressing a problem that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about a lot of this with indexable, but one of the main issues that I consistently see in the crypto space is what we call, you know, fracture. You know, there's so many different applications, so many different um, ways of trading, and none of them really speak to each other. Um, and that's true for, you know, aggregating all of that data to to be able to run that, those analytics that you guys are talking about. Um, and we see that everywhere. You know, even in the on the execution side where where Dexful stands, you know, there's fracture between chains. There's fracture between uh, gaming sites and, and how you get the required tokens. Even you know, analytics platforms. It's it's really difficult to kind of have everything in one place. We don't we don't have 35 year old Bloomberg terminal with all the information that you need in one in one spot. All your analytics, all your data, and all your execution. And I think yeah. that's where where the utility of of new protocols and new new projects um, and platforms kind of rear rear its head over the next you know, two to five years. Yeah, and we're you know we're really excited to to partner with you guys to bring like the the trading terminal experience directly into the Simul product. So kind of rounding it out as a really complete portfolio management. Um, and risk management tool where you don't have to do crazy stuff to go get the TWAP orders, et cetera. So uh, we're really excited about about our partnership and also some of the things that we will will be able to do when integrating your data with ours for our customers. 100%. And, you know, like coming, coming from that background of traditional finance where you have things like Aladdin and Triton and EMSX, where all of that is together. It's all in, it's all in one place. You have your portfolio management, you have your execution, you have um, all of your, your risk models in a single spot. You know, that's where the industry will continue to go. And I think that's part of the reason why uh, we haven't seen even more adoption of crypto uh, historically is because, you know, even the fracture on the wallet side, I mean, you guys see this all the time within, within Coral. I'm sure you have a hundred different wallets that you guys are trading out of. There's just so many different um, I guess breaking points uh, within this space. Yeah, we, we, I mean, there's such a long way to go to um, get everything in shape. But you know, like I kind of mentioned before, it's like building the things that kind of have the most friction. And I think um, with Simul, kind of Josh's plan and idea was to attack kind of that space where you know, again just to reiterate your point, it's like Wall Street, it took, you know, a massive amount of time for Wall Street to adopt computers because all of these tools needed to, do, needed to be created once the internet came about. And so I think it's no different in this sense, but it's just, it has to happen and interact directly on chain. And so it's just the nature of a different beast. And every cycle we see, you know, better and better products because of venture funding. So um, I think I think we will get there, and uh, this is like definitely a step in the right direction, because you know 
I think like one of our biggest problems has been exactly that point where, you know, you're running a hundred different wallets and you have positions everywhere and something happens, like it's very hard to react and to know exactly where it is, you know, where everything is. And um, so, yeah, like that's one of the areas of usability that I think is kind of a no brainer. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, where all the money was made, uh, when I guess co computers were coming into the financial space was anyone that was at the cutting edge, you know, the times of Arca and the times of, you know, flash boys, obviously we have flash bots now, but you know, that's where a lot of the, the big money was, was, was made with the monster button well back in the day, the, the nascency of algo trading. Yeah. They, they leveraged data and computers and put it together and made some really crazy stuff. And I think that's definitely lacking as a stamp, people aren't able to leverage their data now to, to do uh, very creative things. So it's it's definitely a handicap, um, which we're you know we want to address as hard as as fast as possible. Um, it just it can't remain where there's like not great. I mean, go ask somebody for their hourly sharp ratio for the last six months. I mean, it's not even really possible at this point, right? So how you can get a sharp ratio out of a DeFi uh, protocol where you're staked in three separate protocols where the LP tokens moved around, you know? So there's a lot of things that need to be addressed that we're working on. And, um, we'll, you know, definitely bring DeFi more mainstream. Yeah. <clears throat> Especially, you know, in, in addition to that, you know, every exchange has their, their data in a completely different manner. So just getting cost basis is, inc is incredibly difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's nearly impossible at this point to, to get it across the board, you know, and then especially to get a composite or an aggregate of your entire portfolio or separate wallets or, you know, stuff like that. So it's 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 really difficult. We're definitely excited to be partnering with, partnering with you guys to see if we can uh, help solve that problem because it's uh, it's obviously a headache for hedge funds and and anyone you know liquid desk at, at VCs anyone that's trading um, into crypto, but. It's even. It's still really hard for you know your average Joe retailer, um, end of year trying to figure out what what taxes you need to pay and what your cost basis were, and that's not even bringing in the regulation opacity. Yep, and the, the data is the first step on making those those problems tractable. One hundred percent. As a, as a funny stat, I don't think it will play into taxes, but um, someone did an analysis on the tornado cash. OFAC ruling, and they figured out that 93% of addresses are within four hops of <laughs> Tornado Cash. So, you know, like, I, I'm just wondering how this stuff will, will play out long term in terms of interacting with potentially an anonymous money, but we'll cross that bridge when we have to. <laughs> I'm not going to <laughs> notch this game up, but I, I think that's a good time to uh, wrap the conversation up. I, I'm super excited about where this is going. I know there's a, a burning need for this stuff personally and like from a B2B kind of institutional side as well, just small players out there. Well, it's really anyone uh, just has to have these questions answered and there's no standard way to do it. I'm excited to see where this, this stuff goes and yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation before we go. Any, any final words and where can we learn more about Simul and Coral? Um, yeah, well, I appreciate you guys having us on. And um, final words would be just uh, we're looking forward to just getting a good product out for, so everybody can, you know, more accurately manage their money and be safer out there. Um, we're, we, you know, we're doing this because we need it in DeFi, and I think everybody else needs the same thing. So it's coming from a place of need, um, and uh, any feedback is welcome along the way. And, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to partnering with you guys and, and integrating uh, your product um, within Simul, and uh, it only makes it better. So. Yeah, and you can find us on the Simul Twitter for now or Simul Medium. All right on, everyone. Well, thank you. I appreciate you guys all joining. Um, next time we'll have to talk about, you know, permissioned pools in, uh, in DeFi and see if that's going to be enough to attract uh, institutional investors and if it's good for us at all. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you guys. See ya.